welcome to another Room for Discussion interview. I'm Saskia, this is Jonathan, and today we are here at Marina Terrain in Amsterdam to interview the outgoing Minister of Defense, Kaisa Ollongren. She has had a career spending more than 30 years in different offices. She's worked extensively in different positions in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and held positions like Deputy Mayor of Amsterdam, Vice Prime Minister of the Netherlands, the Minister of Interior Affairs, and now, the topic of this interview, the Minister of Defense. In these roles, she's been at the heart of Dutch decision-making uh, in a time of the largest war on the European continent since 1945. She arguably holds one of the most important jobs in the Netherlands. During this interview, we will talk about how she views the state of Dutch defense, her vision on the steps necessary to ensure Dutch sovereignty, as well as its relationship to its allies, and the political support needed to make the changes that she has made during her term. Please give a warm welcome to Minister Ollongren. So welcome, uh, Minister Ollongren. Uh, before we start with the interview, uh, I would like to ask your comments about the news of yesterday. Uh, how do you think Dutch defense will be impacted by uh, Rutte's secretary generalship at NATO? Oh, <laughs> that news. <laughs> uh, well, I think, I mean, it, I think it's good for NATO to have someone with his experience. Uh, I, I said last week when I was in Brussels uh, to uh, Jens Stoltenberg that uh, your successor has big shoes to fill. Uh, but I think that Mark Rutte will be able to fill them. And normally the, the sec gen, he is f for all of us, for all allies. Uh, and that means that it, it doesn't really matter uh, if you're Dutch or Estonian or uh, Norwegian or, or any country. Uh, he, he has to, um, to act in, our, in the interests of all countries. Uh, and of course, I mean, for, for us, you have, we, we, we know him uh, and he knows us, uh, but he's, uh, his service is for NATO. All right. So you started your career um, as a history student at the University of Amsterdam. So how do you think history students in the future will look back at this current moment? Well, I, I'm sure that the war in Ukraine is a pivotal moment in our history. Uh, in, in Europe. So it is, uh, as you said, eh, we have not known a war of this scale in Europe since the Second World War, uh, when, uh, when the Netherlands was occupied. Uh, and uh, of course, there, has, there is always war. It's a pattern in history, there's always war. And uh, we've also been part uh, of other wars, wars, sometimes also by choice. Uh, but, but this war and this uh, revenge Interventionist and revisionist attitude of Putin and, and Russia is an existential threat to European countries, uh, our partners and allies, like for instance the Baltic states. So the war in Ukraine is not just about Ukraine, it is really about our way of life, it's about democracy, it's about the rule of law, uh, it's about uh, territorial integrity, it's about the very principles of the United Nations. Uh, and that's why I feel it is a pivotal moment that the war started, but even more importantly, uh, how it will end. Yeah. Talking a bit about your career and how you've ended up here, as mentioned before, you have held very diverse positions and most of them, or all of them actually, outside of the Ministry of Defense. I think it's nice to have somebody leading the Ministry of Defense that's not perhaps specialized in it, but why do you think you were a good fit for the position? Um, well, for me, coming to the Ministry of Defense was sort of making the, the circle. I, I studied history, uh, focusing very much on international relations uh, and uh, working with other countries, uh, working on cooperation within the European Union and NATO with other parts of the world has been uh, something that I believe very strongly in. And I've done it in different positions. When I was a deputy mayor here, I was responsible for economic affairs. Uh, I started uh, Startup Amsterdam, uh, which was getting business in into Amsterdam, getting the best and brightest to, to study in Amsterdam, to start <coughs> to become entrepreneurs in Amsterdam. So, so reaching out and, and connecting to other countries is something that I believe very strongly in. And I think um, uh, international relations, defense is not, not only about fighting, it's not only about the military part, because there is never only a military solution. There also has to be a diplomatic solution, a political Solution. So connecting that, I think, in the Ministry of Defense, uh, uh, well, that was that's something that was really necessary, uh, and I think we've made progress uh, there in the in the last two years. 
Yeah. So would you also say that there is a certain political skill set that you built up during your career that was then beneficial? Do you think that it is nice to have ministers that are first and foremost politicians instead of experts in their fields? Yes, I, well, I think you have to be able to connect all those things. Huh? You, we come from different backgrounds. I was a civil servant in The Hague before I became a politician. Then I was a deputy mayor here in Amsterdam before I became a minister. Uh, and you always learn something in, in your job that you bring into a new job. But you need all, all those skills. You need the diplomatic skills, political skills. And you also need to be interested in the substance uh, of what you're doing. And I think there is never one person who has everything uh, and I think, I mean, for the Ministry of Defense, there are countries where you put a general in position, but normally those are not the countries that are the most democratic or, uh, or the most uh, open. So I think it's good you have a politician who takes political responsibility, who relies on the military advice of his, uh, his or her chief uh, of uh, defense, the, the, the most senior military, uh, who is very knowledgeable on the military part. And that, that's, I think, the way we have organized it, and that's also the best way. And you don't fe face an easy challenge. Uh, European collective security is under threat in a way it hasn't been for a long time. Um, in France, we have Emmanuel Macron talking a lot about maybe expanding France's nuclear umbrella. He was at the Euro Ukrainian peace summit with uh, uh, a nuclear uh, like briefcase. Mm. We have the Zetewende of Schultz and, your co and Boris Pistorius. Mm. Despite the Netherlands' very clear strategic position and now NATO and now British appointment to NATO, the Dutch vision of a Zeitwende is less clear for European collective security. What do you think the Dutch vision is? Well, the Dutch vision is, I, I think it's very clear because it's rooted in uh, the, the Dutch tradition. Uh, and it is not a coincidence that we were a founding member of the European Union and also of NATO. Uh, we were there from the beginning because we realized, being a relatively small country, uh, that we depend on the cooperation with others. Uh, so our strength and our defense depends on how, we st how strong we are together. Uh, so we didn't need to do uh, a Zeitenwende or, or to, to, to put a mark on that because it's already in the way we work. But what we did need to do was, of course, to increase our defense budget, because we have also been cutting the budget for a very long time, for decades. Uh, I think we were late in uh, reassessing that and increasing uh, the defense budget. Uh, and, and that's why we are still also working on, uh, on the gaps that were created by those, uh, by those budget cuts. But, uh, but being strong and vocal on the support for Ukraine, and also being strong and vocal on the need for strong cooperation and strong alliances, um, is something that comes very natural, I think, to the Netherlands. But then, is the Dutch policy guided by our allies, or do do you think that there is a separate vision in that? Well, I, no, I think, of course, we have to form that vision uh, uh, collectively. Uh, but our vision is that of, um, uh, for instance, the, the freedom of navigation is a strong principle for us. We're, we're a seafaring nation, so for us it's vital that, that uh, also commercial vessels can travel around the world. Our supply chains depend on it. That's why we act uh, on that. We are aware of hybrid and cyber threats, not only the war that we see, but also the things that we don't see. And we're very vocal on that as well. So I think uh, collectively we have to form uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 we have to agree on the steps to take, uh, but we don't really have to agree on agree where we are going, but because that vision I think we all share. So I hear you mention the word collective often. Um, we now have a new government that will see increases in defense still. However, the new government is decidedly less European, less cooperative. How worried are you about that prospect? Um, well, the, as I read the program of the new government, they say they will continue the support for Ukraine. I think that is very important. I've also heard my successor state that just after he, he was at the formateur's office. That is very, very important. Uh, to increase uh, the defense spending is also important. I know that that is in the program. And I think that is the reality. The reality is we cannot close our borders. We cannot uh, uh, lean back. We, we cannot afford not to engage uh, in the European Union, in NATO, and also in other parts of the world, in the Indo-Pacific, in the Sahel, uh, in, the, in the Red Sea. Um, we 
are interdependent. And that means that others depend on us, but we also mm. depend on them, and that we have to take our responsibility for that. So I, even if the new government thinks uh, it can act, you know, uh, on its own, more nationalist, they will find out it's impossible. And it's not in the best interest of the Dutch people. Yeah, but regardless of this, there is some disagreement, for example, on Israel. And I think also on a European level, there is lots of disagreement within different countries. And ultimately, I think that it's true to characterize Dutch idea of defense relying on the idea of deterrence, which very much relies on a strong front. How do you see that having these discussions and debates among countries, among parties within countries, can still happen while remaining, retaining a united front towards the outside? Well, that's, a, of course, a very good question. And I think we, we, we show l much unity when it comes to Ukraine. And we've shown less unity when we saw the war happening in Gaza. That's also evolved, because I think now, even perhaps not all countries, but most countries are very, very critical of the war in Gaza uh, and are saying to Israel, there has to be a ceasefire. We have, uh, you have to comply also with the ruling of the International Court. Uh, and we want this war to stop and there has to be a two-state solution. And that is the position of, my, of me, of my government. And that's what we're, what we're saying. Um, uh, but, and I think also you don't always have to agree on everything as long as you in the end act and I think both NATO and the EU have shown that we are different countries, different political cultures, different political choices, but we are able to agree on the important things uh, when necessary. And what does it mean when, in order for agreement, we have to take exemptions into account, like, I don't know why, but granting uh, Hungary um, an opportunity to be a part of the NATO's policy on supporting Ukraine. Yeah. So is that really showing unity? <coughs> it is at least, it is, I think, a small price to pay to be able to continue uh, as an alliance. I think the same goes for um, uh, Turkey uh, blocked, and Hungary, by the way, blocked for a long time that Finland and Sweden, especially Sweden, could join NATO. But in the end, uh, we got there. And it is in the, in the interest of the alliance to have Sweden and Finland in because of strategic depth for the alliance, but also for, for those countries who are more safe inside. Uh, and as I said, there are different countries, different politics. Uh, uh, and and if it, so it does take time. Uh, even uh, getting Hungary to agree on uh, Rutte's NATO candidacy uh, took time. But we do find ways to get there. So how sustainable is that on the long term? Because war is something that happens really quickly. Yeah. And in those cases, we don't really have time for no. these types of ne negotiations. Um, and how long can we continue doing this type of horse trading uh, before we've reached a point where we're not willing to give Hungary or Turkey more and they need more in order to support? Have we then reached the end of NATO? Or No, because I think if, if NATO Article 5 is triggered, then you don't have to do that anymore. Because then we go in a, a different modus. Then we have Article 5, Sakur has his... Uh, responsibilities, uh, and and then then we act. Uh, the difficulty is when you're in in between, in between peace uh, and war. Then it's more uh, difficult. Uh, and the sa same goes for the support for Ukraine. First, it was bilateral. Then we started uh, doing it more like in the European Union. Now we're trying to. We've already agreed on a coordination mechanism that belongs to NATO. We've agreed on it, so it's going to function as from now. Uh, we have to agree on the funding. So in the European Union, we have agreed on the European Peace Facility support for Ukraine. We have Ukra Ukraine um, Assistance Fund for military aid. Uh, and that one is still being blocked. It's there, but the actual payments are blocked by Hungary. So that's an example of why, where, where it's not functioning as it should. Uh, but I, uh, I think that we have, we have evolved from, you know, from those ad hoc policies to more structured and coordinated uh, the aid to Ukraine. And, and that means that you have less uh, problems like the problems that you mentioned. Yeah. While those uh, defense spending and cooperation has increased, it is also seems to be a little bit true, at least that we are mainly reliant on American policy when guiding this. Macron in his Sorbonne speech argued for an independent European foreign policy. I think that it's, yeah, Interesting to see how that would look then differently from now. What do you personally think about this? Are you in favor of it? And what would really be, be then the independent European policy as opposed to the American one? 
Well, uh, first of all, I don't think we should be opposed to, to the American ones. I think that we, are, we have the same interests. Uh, and NATO is a transatlantic alliance. It's for the safety of Europe. Uh, and that is also a strategic interest for, for the United States. So we have to try to stick together. But I think the United States, and I, not Trump or, or uh, anybody from that side, but they have rightly asked Europe to step up and to do more for our own security. And that's what we have to do. So we have to think about how to increase our uh, defense spending, to how to increase the output from our defense industry. Uh, and we have to be able to act also as European countries, also when the United States will not come uh, to our uh, collective <coughs> defense. And I think we have taken steps. Uh, we are not there yet, of course. But also, I mean, if you look at the United States and the size of the United States and the size of their military, um, uh, there's, a, there's a huge gap between all the different countries. But if we add up all the European countries and if we succeed in fighting the fragmentation uh, if we create interoperability and if we make a European defense industry, uh, then we're going to be a, a strong player. And still, I would prefer to be a strong player together with the United States. Um, but on the topic of fragmentation, um, there has been long, quite a big op opposition against a common EU foreign policy after the last European Parliament parliamentary elections. That doesn't seem to have changed a lot. Um, how realistic is one common European defense and one common e uh, EU foreign policy if the fragmentation is so uh, clear? Well, there are two types of fragmentation. There's sort of political fragmentation. I think that's the one you were referring to. And there's a fragmentation in capabilities, which is a, a, a problem that within NATO uh, that we've known for a long time that we have to fix. Uh, and both are difficult. Uh, but at the same time, I think that you see now that uh, a, a European foreign policy that is uh, formed by uh, the Commission, uh, the Council and the High Rep, uh, that it's necessary and that countries also see that we are stronger if we face these challenges together. Uh, we better uh, hang together or we will hang separately. I think Churchill said that. So uh, I think that principle must guide us and every country must see that it is in their interest to be part of that. Uh, and if, if we don't, we are going to be very, very vulnerable and it's going to cost us dearly. So I, I think uh, uh, working on that, uh, doing that in our council meetings uh, and taking steps, not a giant step, but smaller steps towards that end. For instance, having a European Commissioner for Defence uh, would be a good step, uh, I think, that gives the Commission some leverage um, to move forward. How is it possible to then bridge those strategic cultures? Because I think it's true that there are capability differences and political differences, but among strategic cultures, for example, the level of threat perception varies greatly across Europe. Yeah. So do you think that it is possible then to get an agreement on, for example, making the Dutch people and nation understand more the fears of Eastern Europeans? Well, that's a very, very good point because we feel safe here. Uh, between Germany, which is our best partner these days, uh, and, and the North Sea and the UK and the United States. We're in a safe place. Uh, at least that's what we feel and what, what we think. But we are not really. We're not safe. Uh, we're not safe unless we work on uh, safety and security. Uh, and I think uh, if you ask our, our military, the army, for instance, is very much integrated into the German army. The navy completely integrated with the Belgian navy. Uh, our Marines, they work with uh, the Royal uh, British uh, Marines. Uh, they are used to cooperating. They know that cooperating makes us stronger. Uh, and I often use it as an example also within NATO to encourage other countries, for instance, the Baltic states, to do more of that. We will see it in Scandinavia between uh, Finland and Sweden, who are already doing it, and they will integrate more with Norway now that they're all NATO countries. So we're going to, in an incremental way, I think we're going to do it, uh, and we have to make sure that the, that the people in our uh, countries feel that that makes us all safer. Yeah. Um, the Dutch have a strong, involved, strong tradition of being involved in peacekeeping missions, both with NATO and the UN, and these have faced a lot of criticism uh, and on many different fronts. Currently, there is less and less international support for it, and lots of people are saying that peacekeeping missions are going back to, the, back to an era where they were in a very limited capacity. No. Do you think this is part of a shifting vision of the Dutch forces, especially while well, you mentioned the protection of trade routes? Is that becoming 
blessed for thing. Well, I think peacekeeping, uh, I, I talked to some UN officials about this and also some former uh, ministers involved in, in this type of decision making. You can only keep peace if there is peace. And the problem of the peacekeeping missions was often that there was no peace to keep. So if you are in Mali for a peacekeeping mission, uh, but there is a, really a war going on between terrorists uh, and the authorities, there is a coup, uh, then it's very difficult to keep the peace. Yeah. Uh, so you have to set the conditions first. And if the conditions are not there, then you probably have the wrong mandate. So you're there with the mission, you're there with your military, you're there to keep peace, uh, and you don't have the mandate to fight, for instance, uh, uh, the terrorism. And that's a problem. And I think so what I think we will probably see not see many of those huge peacekeeping missions in very volatile uh, countries. But what we can do more is more smaller missions mm -hmm. uh, who are on the forefront before uh, the, uh, the, 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 the difficulties start uh, in training, uh, training missions in uh, several countries in, in Africa. Uh, and so I, I think the United Nations, uh, the peacekeeping, uh, but also NATO who is now in Iraq, for instance, with a mission, uh, also to help strengthen uh, the, the Iraqi armed forces against uh, terrorism. I think these they will remain important, but they will be more tailor-made and more targeted. Okay. Um, before we move on to talking more about the state of the Dutch defense, uh, let's take some audience questions. Uh, yes, raise your hand and yeah, actually you can, I think, just... Mag je hebben een recorder? Yes, yeah. great, look at this. <coughs> My first question, of a thought, would have been to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Why uh, does uh, the Netherlands violate the international agreements on non-proliferation by training our uh, uh, pilots how to deal with the nuclear weapons uh, with their uh, uh, F-35s? But I was 20 years ago a civilian peacekeeper to keep the Tamil Tigers apart from the military in uh, Sri Lanka. And I'd like to know from you how much progress you made uh, towards uh, peacekeeping uh, without carrying weapons in the past uh, years you were in. Yeah, in, you mean in, in, in different parts of, of, of the world in the peacekeeping? Mm -hmm. yeah. Without arms? Without like arms, yeah. But I, I think that was also the question that was just asked about uh, can you do peacekeeping and you are experienced uh, if there is no peace, uh, if you have a mandate for peacekeeping, but there is uh, a constant violation of uh, people, uh, of, of peace, uh, like we saw in Mali, but also in other parts uh, of the world, if there is constant fighting and you are there with a mandate that does not allow you uh, to engage because you have no weapons, because you are there to uh, keep uh, peace, then it's very difficult, I think, to uh, to do just that. So you have to have a political and diplomatic effort to set the conditions uh, to be able to keep peace. Uh, and I think we have seen in several places around the world that that is very, very difficult. We see it in the Balkans, in Kosovo and in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we are also now, um, where with a, I think, re relatively successful because it is, it is quiet. And when in Kosovo we saw the increase of the tensions there was also an increase uh, of, of the military there to keep, keep at least the situation calm and under control, and that worked. But it is, it is difficult and it's volatile, and you don't want to be there to fight. You want to be there to help uh, to prevent uh, that fighting starts. Um, but uh, but the, the mandate issue uh, is, is really something that we are constantly trying to, uh, to, to work out and to improve. But in the situations where it would work, uh, did you uh, make teams to uh, work as a civilian peacekeeper? Well, civilian peacekeeper, yes, but I, that's not my portfolio. That's the Minister of Foreign Affairs. But of course, we look at that. In, uh, uh, in the Caucasus, there is an EU mission, a civilian mission. Uh, there are police uh, missions, uh, also uh, different parts of the world. And we always, as the Netherlands, try to engage also in those missions. Yeah. Let's go to the front here. Yeah. Yes, because you were saying that for Dutch citizens, it's important to know that the army is spreading its connections towards also Germany and the UK, as you mentioned, and that we are united against the Russian threat. But how would you react to maybe uh, some anxiety that Dutch citizens also have 
by extending the army internationally and maybe uh, that creating a fear that Russia feels more threatened. What, uh, yeah, what kind of reply would you have for that? Uh, well, idea? first of all, I don't really buy the story that R Russia feels threatened, quite yeah. honestly, because Russia, um, no, first of all, they know that NATO is a defensive alliance. NATO has never been attacked, but has also never attacked a country not in the mandate of NATO. We're only there to, uh, to defend. Uh, and the narrative from Russia that there is some kind of threat, uh, I, I think that that's rooted in uh, that NATO has, has grown. Huh? More countries, especially in Eastern Europe, have entered NATO, but at mm -hmm. their own request, at their own uh, free will, uh, as part of the open door policy of, uh, of NATO. So that's not a threat uh, to, uh, to Russia. Uh, there have been no broken promises uh, towards uh, towards Russia. So I think what is really happening is that Putin has uh, is a revisionist. He, uh, he wants to recreate something from the past. It's not completely clear what he wants to recreate, either <coughs> the old uh, Soviet Empire or, or, or the Russian Empire. Um, and I, I believe that that is the narrative that he is trying to tell uh, to, uh, to people, while mm -hmm. Russia is the country that is actually threatening other countries. Not only threatening, but actually invading another country, which is completely independent, has every right to defend its independency, uh, even by a treaty between that same Russia and Ukraine, in which Ukraine uh, had the nuclear weapons that were in Ukraine removed to Russia in return for its independence and territorial integrity. So uh, the threat is really coming from, uh, from Russia and uh, it's not the other way around. And I think uh, fear for, for escalation, I see only uh, one party escalating and that's Russia. Uh, they are escalating by constantly bombing uh, Ukraine, uh, by killing Ukrainian citizens, by attacking the energy infrastructure in Ukraine, which will leave many people in Ukraine in the cold this winter. Uh, between 30 and 50 percent of the of the electricity is hit, uh, and there will be new heat uh, this this winter. So that is the escalation that I see, and not the other way around. I think we'll spend a lot of time talking about Ukraine, but some of the threats um, that are being made on Russian television aren't just limited to Ukraine, the Baltic states, even the Netherlands, because of its strategic yeah. position, has been threatened with nuclear attacks. Um, we have a presidential election in the U.S. coming up where Trump has been decidedly um, critical of NATO, to say. Um, you've said that the 2% GDP that we are now doing, we need to be doubled in order to protect um, the Netherlands. It should the U.S. pull out of NATO. But given the sheer strength and nuclear umbrella of the U.S., would doubling spending really be enough to protect ourselves from Russian at attacks? Well, I also said it was a theoretical exercise because, I mean, we, even if we spend, if we double the spending, uh, it will not immediately lead to strengthening uh, of our armed forces. Uh, I think uh, the uh, NATO, the collective defense, um, the nuclear umbrella as deterrence uh, is very important for, uh, for all of us. Uh, I think if the U.S. if Trump would win, and and we don't know that, and we also don't know exactly what he will do, but that is the big problem, of course, is in predictability. Um, uh, maybe you could argue that he rightly uh, encouraged European countries to spend more on defense. Okay, we're doing that now. Uh, so I hope we can be able to rely on our on our big uh, ally across the ocean. Um, but I think, uh, quite honestly, uh, we are we are not there yet, uh, and we ha there are so many barriers that we have to take first, uh, not only in capabilities, uh, but also in the way we organize it. It is organized within NATO, which means with a strong fingerprint of, uh, of the United States. Despite the increase in funding, there's also loads of vacancies that still need to be filled. Yeah. The, currently, the Dutch army has a fifth of the number of personnel compared to a Cold War height. Is money alone enough to ensure we have the military that can protect us? Or should we seriously consider conscription? Mm, well, we have not chosen to go to back to conscription. Uh, the, the armed forces now are different than during the Cold War. Uh, we have uh, diff we, we 
fight in a different way. We have different type of, of capabilities. I think we had more than 300 F-16s at one point. Uh, and now we're aiming at having a little more than 50 F-35, which is a much more capable uh, aircraft. And so uh, working in a different way with also with new techniques, we're going to work a lot more with uncrewed um, uh, types of uh, weapons. We see now in the war in Ukraine how important drones have become in every every field, in every domain. So war fighting is changing. And, uh, and of course, you still need people and we have to fill those vacancies and we have to make our armed forces scalable to scale up and also scale down again. But conscription is asking everybody to join uh, for a year or a year and a half. Um, and that would take a lot of uh, energy from the organization and it will cost a lot of money and it's not very effective. So I think we are copying now the Swedish and the Norwegian way, which is uh, trying to find uh, young people who, who want to do a year of service, uh, to give them that possibility, to train them uh, in a military way. And then again, to leave, to go to study or to work, uh, maybe become a reservist, and some of those will, will stay. But then you have uh, a scalable organization. So we think that's more effective than uh, restarting the conscription. Yeah. Um, surely voluntary uh, jo people joining uh, the military is much preferred. A recent YouGov poll found 36% of Dutch people said that they would be willing to defend their country. That is even lower for young people. We now have an audience of young people yeah. and an audience of young people uh, who are going to watch this at home. What would your pitch be um, for the, the year, the Sweden model maybe, or maybe even longer? Why would people want to put their life on the line for this? What would your pitch be? Well, first of all, I think that if there was actually a threat and a war, like in Ukraine, the number would increase. Because that's what happened in Ukraine. When the war started, uh, the large-scale invasion started, uh, there were lots of young people who volunteered immediately. They dropped everything. <coughs> Sorry. Mm. Secondly, the pitch now for the Defensity College... Yeah, thanks. Uh, for, a, uh, for a Defensity uh, College is that <coughs> you learn a lot. You ask one more question. Um, ask <laughs> we ask another question. Um, yeah? Okay. Uh, another issue that we are facing is the issue with increased funding, uh, being like not enough to kind of uh, respond to the demand for production of uh, armaments. It's we don't really have the production or capacity mm. at all. I think there's been a lot of discussion around this. Is it important for the Netherlands to be reliant on other parties for having this armament structure built up, or should we be independent in this? That's the Netherlands? Yeah. It's impossible. <clears throat> we can never be completely independent or autonomous when it comes to, to weapons, when it comes to anything, really. But that's why we're part of the European Union. And I think we have to have more strategic autonomy within the European Union, and that's why we have to have less uh, national approach of the defense industry. Because within the European Union, you have an internal market for almost everything, but not for the defense industry. It's very national still. Uh, and that's that's why we're so fragmented. Uh, and I think uh, it's very important for us to have uh, ammunition uh, uh, production in the European Union at a relatively high level, to be able to use all new technology also uh, in the European Union. But we need to cooperate and we need to find where our strengths lie. And I think in the Netherlands, uh, we don't have an ammunition uh, factory anymore. Uh, that's not our strength. We're a small country. Uh, we have uh, many experts in the high-tech field. We're good in radars, for instance. So let's focus on that. Uh, let's focus on the maritime sector. We have a very strong maritime sector, uh, also in defense industry. Uh, and, and so we all have our specialties, and we have to join forces. Um, but joining forces right now means a lot on relying on American manufacturing. Russia has increased their wartime capacity a lot. It has given it an edge in the Ukrainian yeah. war. Um, shouldn't we be a little bit more aggressive maybe in repurposing um, some of our own industrial capacity to some military um, goals? It could be radars if we're better at those. But it is true that we are not able to match Russian pace in, at any, in any way. 
um, and if we don't have the US to rely on anymore, or well, not to the same extent, I would say we have problems. Maybe it's a surprise, but uh, the issues that we have here in increasing our production capacity, the United States has them also, exactly the same. So we both uh, here on this side of the ocean, the other side of the ocean, we have to increase our production cap uh, capacity. Uh, and uh, we don't want to match Russia in the way that they conduct this war economy, because in GDP, Russia is the Benelux. It's really nothing. Uh, but the difference is that they, in an autocracy, you can just order uh, whatever you want at the cost of society and just ordinary people. And in the long run, it's not sustainable. So I think we have to do it in a smarter way, which is to make sure that we increase uh, production by doing joint procurement, by doing long-term contracts, so that industry knows that it's not only for now or next year, it's for 10 to 20 years that we're going to, to need their availability. And we have to learn from the pandemic, when we had exactly the same issue, uh, that the supply chains didn't work, uh, that we were not able to increase production at the speed of relevance. Uh, and, and that's what we're, what we're doing, what we're working at now. And I think we are re already at a much higher level than we were, and in one or two years' time, we will be on the level that is needed for the long run. And I think that's a much better and more sustainable way to go about this issue than turning your, your economy into a war economy. Planning for a long-term sustainable production of weapons manufacture is also an interesting choice to make during a time of peace. Yep. I think that it is clear from everything we've discussed today that it is needed, but how does this change the relationship that we have to companies that produce lots of things that you need for producing weapons, for example, like data steel? Yeah, that's a, it's a good point, because uh, uh, you, you, we have seen, for instance, in uh, Ukraine, in Mariupol, uh, they had an important factory, I think even several factories, uh, and a lot of production lines just simply stopped because the steel didn't come anymore from, from Ukraine. So I think we need to ask our uh, ministries of economic affairs, and ours is already doing it, uh, and also the European Commission to, to, you know, to map uh, uh, everything that we need and to see where our uh, dependencies lie uh, and if they are outside of uh, the European Union to make sure that we either know for sure that we can depend on those countries and if not to make sure uh, that we have it somewhere in Europe and of course uh, we want it in the safest way uh, so it's, it's not an easy, easy solution. So moving away a little bit from massive steel production and weapon manufacturing <laughs> Um, any international newspaper right now is full with stories of spies in France being caught, in Germany being caught, in the UK being caught, uh, Russian and Chinese spies. Um, stories of such spies in the Netherlands are a little rarer, despite the Netherlands' very clear strategic position. Are we simply not catching them? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> now, well, no, it is a good point. Um, I think we all our, our intelligence uh, agencies are very much focused uh, uh, on this issue of espionage, of uh, hybrid and, 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 and cyber uh, threats. And it's happening. It's happening everywhere. Uh, so we should not, I always say, we should not be naive. Of course, it's also happening here. Uh, and the agencies are warning uh, also for these issues. Uh, our military intelligence agency, MIVD, warned about uh, Chinese. A hack. Uh, uh, we have, uh, at the time, with several European countries, expelled uh, Russian intelligence officers uh, from uh, from from the Netherlands. So there is no reason at all to think that it's not happening here, uh, as it is in many other countries. And I think we have to be very, very much uh, alert on the possibility of sabotage or preparing for sabotage, which is why we're monitoring uh, the North Sea very closely. There's a lot of uh, under seabed or on seabed infrastructure there. Um, and uh, so I, I, I'm sure that, that we are treated no differently than, than other countries. On the subject of cyber attacks, uh, we had uh, somewhat infamously uh, Admiral Bauer uh, on our stage. And he recently said that NATO could consider a cyber attack uh, a military attack and would, re -attack and would react militarily as well. Um, do you agree with his assessment there? Um. Uh, well, I think on the principle I agree, because I think uh, when, um, when the treaty uh, was drafted, uh, it didn't exist. Cyber was simply non-existent. Uh, and so now it's a question of definition, uh, and it would also depend on the effect 
uh, of the cyber attack. But I think you could imagine a certain type of cyber attack that would be so disruptive that there's really no difference from a conventional attack to a, to a cyber attack. And in that case, uh, it could apply. Yes. I think this is a great time to look at our audience again to see if there's any questions. We have Max to come record your question. Let's go there. Can I just... Uh... You need to wait well, for we want to record it later, so if you could wait for one second, you'll be awesome. Thank you. Yes, you are like talking a lot about increasing the production of weapons. And also what is like a counter argument that's been going around about that is that one, one, when like once the threat becomes less and you don't need all those weapons anymore, you still have all those weapons. Yeah. And how do you see that? Because those weapons can of course end up in like hands of people and it can be quite threatening to people. So yeah. what is your response to that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, first of all, um, uh, there, are, there is some reluctancy also in the financial sector, for instance, to invest in, uh, in defense industry <coughs> because of the fear that those weapons might end up in the wrong hands. Uh, so it's very important to have uh, a control on that. So if the NATO countries or the Netherlands, if we buy those weapons, we are responsible for those weapons. And they cannot leave... Uh, our possession, they cannot be sold uh, unless you are sure that they cannot end up uh, in, uh, in the wrong hands. So we have to have weapon control. And um, what is also important, I think, is that uh, we now we need those weapons for, the, for deterrence, in principle. Uh, but having deterrence means that in the end you must also be willing uh, to fight uh, if, uh, if necessary. Otherwise deterrence doesn't work. Uh, so you have to have these weapons. You have to uh, train with these weapons uh, to uh, to able to be able to uh, to deter. And the third point is that if you uh, ask a defense uh, a weapon uh, producing company now what the biggest issue is, it is that they say you want them now or the ammunition you want it now. But then when the war is over and your stocks are filled, you're not going to buy more. Uh, and then we started all those new production facilities and we have to close them and we have to fire people uh, and, and that is not, I mean, it doesn't work that way. So I think we also must be uh, willing to pay a price for that, for, to ask the industry to be able to scale up and to scale down. It costs, it, it comes at a price, but then we know uh, that when necessary, they will be able to start their production lines uh, sooner. Uh, and, and we will be able to have access uh, to what is needed in case uh, of uh, uh, in case we have to defend uh, ourselves. So there are, are different aspects to be taken into consideration, but on your question, I think weapon control uh, is the most important one. And there are always risks also with the weapons that go to, to Ukraine, but we have, the, we have um, they, they comply you know, on paper to, uh, to this basis of uh, uh, not, you know, they're not going to sell or give those weapons to anybody else who can use them in, in the different types of situations where there could be uh, civilian casualties or in the hand of terrorists, of criminals. Uh, and that's why we have this weapon control uh, system in place, which unfortunately will never be perfect, but I think it is very important uh, as a principle and also very important as a policy uh, to, uh, to comply with. So any discussion that talks about defending ourselves needs to include Ukraine. We've mentioned it already. Um, but while the EU and the US packages has helped relieve pressure on Kharf Kharkiv province somewhat, it is unlikely um, that Ukraine can retake all of the territory that was taken by the Russian, uh, seized by the Russians. When should we consider talking about peace deals? I mean, any time is a good time to talk about peace, but not in the case of Ukraine when there is a gun pointed at your head. So, um, uh, first of all, I think it is really up to Ukraine also to decide whether or not they want to engage in these talks. Second, of course, in the end, there is not never a military solution, and uh, there have, has to be a start of a, of a discussion on uh, peace conditions. But I think it starts also with uh, that we have to uh, be uh, aware of the fact that if Russia is rewarded for its aggression, uh, then this is not the first time they're going to invade another country, uh, not the last time they're going to invade another country, but the first time. 
uh, it's very bad news for for other countries if if the aggression is rewarded, for instance, by as they did with the Crimea annexation, if they also could annex uh, the other uh, oblasts in uh, in Ukraine. Um, so, and that is why it's so important that Ukraine continues to to defend itself and to fight back. And, and I think you also have to realize that the reason that Ukraine has not been able to push Russia back. It's because they have heavily, heavily fortified uh, themselves uh, behind uh, the front line with uh, an incredible number of mines, landmines, um, uh, trenches, uh, and uh, and a lot of of soldiers uh, and already a lot of, of of human lives. So it comes at an incredibly high cost. But it would, I mean, in practice. Um all peace deals um, are kind of made with a gun to your head because that is the reality of war. Um, I think you point out how uh, big the, the cost is and how much we want to avoid Russia winning and getting rewarded. But how do you, in practice, then get to any situation where there will be peace at some point? Because well, Russia the, will continue pointing a gun. The, I think the, the, the peace deals that we know that were made with a gun against the head were the ones that where the aggressor lost. Uh, so that's also peace. That's true. Um, but that, in that case, it would be uh, would be Russia that had to lose. And I think, uh, uh, like I said, uh, of course, there, in the beginning of the, after the large-scale invasion, there were talks. They actually met in, in Belarus, uh, in Turkey, uh, different places. They did talk to each other, uh, but they got nowhere. Uh, and and that's why I think there is no sign of good faith uh, from uh, from Russia. So that's why I'm at this moment pessimistic that that will actually happen at this at this time. But as long as we continue to support Ukraine and Ukraine uh, keeps up this this effort that they're doing, and and we're seeing the difficulties at the front, the new front that's opened in Kharkiv, we've also seen successes. We've seen successes last year. We've seen successes on the Black Sea. I mean, they've pushed back the whole Russian Black Fleet without having a navy. And that's really quite an achievement. Uh, they've been able to take out capabilities uh, from from Russia that are very scarce. Uh, the airfields are not safe. The radars are not safe. So even if it's difficult, uh, they still uh, are able to to hold uh, the line and to uh, have have successes in this war. Um, so it may take a long time, but I'm afraid that we will uh, we have no choice but to continue to support uh, them for as long as it takes. I think that it is very honorable that you are putting the Ukrainian interest into the forefront here. And I think that it's clear that that should be done. However, a clear demand of Ukrainians in this case has been the fact that there can be no peace without regime change in Russia. Do you think that the Western countries are really recognizing this? Do you think that this is really something that Macron can keep himself to? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if regime change in Russia would change anything. I don't know what next regime there would be after Putin. It's not a, a democracy. It's not like any other country, really, that that I know. And um, so, I, I, I mean, for the Russian people, I would hope that there will be a regime change. But it's been a very brief period of time only between the, the, the uh, end of the Soviet Union uh, and the Putin era, where there was a sort of a window of opportunity for a more normal uh, country. Uh, where people are not oppressed, uh, where opposition is, does not end up in, in jail, uh, and uh, where uh, uh, Prigozhin, for instance, uh, I wouldn't call him one of the good guys, by the way, but when he did turn against the regime, he ended up uh, in a plane that uh, that fell down. So, um, yeah, for the people in Russia, I hope for a regime change, but I'm afraid that's not in sight. So uh, to have it as a condition, yeah, I don't know if that's going to work. Okay, so mm -hmm. then there is a limit to... But there is a limit to what we what we can uh, what we can achieve, yeah. and I think if this regime would be willing uh, to uh, to conduct peace negotiations, then you would have to to deal with them, but not as I said with a gun against your head. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so um, the realities of Russia's escalation have been true for as long as they've done the full scale invasion in Ukraine, if not before. Um, military aid that we've sent often was conditioned on it not being used in sovereign Russian territory to evoke, uh, to evoke escalation. Um, it's never been a particularly persuasive image that 
Russia was going to not escalate. You've recently stated that you will not restrict the use of the F-16s that you'll send to Ukraine. Why does that shift come now and not much earlier? Well, first of all, because of uh, the type of weapons that we've sent. Uh, we don't have those uh, deep precision uh, um, uh, missiles. Um, uh, we have sent pan Panzer Howitzers, we've sent uh, Patriots, uh, but not the Scalps or, or the Storm Shadows uh, or, 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 or the American, the HIMARS. So that's one of the reasons. Um, so and, and it's become more on the forefront of the debate, I think, now seeing that for Ukraine it was very difficult to defend itself if they could not target inside of Russia because they're attacked from those parts of, uh, of Russia. Uh, and, and for us it's very simple. We don't, we're not, we've not changed our policy. Our policy has been from the beginning. We want you to comply with the uh, international humanitarian law uh, and you're using it in self-defense, Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. Uh, and that applies to everything, uh, also to the F-16s. Um, which will not mean that they will be able to use them over Russian territory. I think that is something that will not happen. But uh, they, they will use them as they see fit in their self-defense, and that can include targets inside of Russia. Yeah, it feels a little bit that it is a game in which Ukraine is asking for things and then it takes everybody a long time to agree. And I think that represents a lot of the democratic principles that we very much value here. But do you think that there is a serious problem with the lagging here? Don't you think that it could have been better to do this committing to a lot of these promises that have been very clearly demanded by Ukraine and countries in Eastern Europe a long time ago? Yeah, but with, the, um, with hindsight, uh, we probably could have done more after the annexation of Crimea. I mean, the sanctions against Russia, I think we forgot about them uh, a couple of years after. Uh, and also in strengthening the Ukraine armed forces, more could have been done before uh, 2022. Um, so it, the, the large-scale invasion was a wake-up call. And we've had the wake up call before, but we pressed the snooze button and then we couldn't anymore. So then we were awake uh, and then we started, uh, I think, to do much more. Uh, but first improvising with handheld weapons, uh, with sniper guns. Uh, and then we turned uh, from the helmets to the howitzers and from the howitzers to the tanks, the F-16s, uh, the Patriots. Uh, and it's it's true. Eh? So Ukraine has many partners that they can rely on, but we are many, and, and we all have different procedures. Uh, and we had to find a coordination mechanism, which we have now, which is called the Ukrainian Defense Contract Group. Uh, we are also coordinating within NATO. We have funding in the EU. We have national funding, uh, but it it does take a lot of uh, hard work uh, and determination uh, to to get there. That's true. Another issue that is highly relevant for many people here and in the context of ongoing conflict is the question of the Dutch position in Israel. Um, the ICC's chief prosecutor has asked for arrest warrants for Netanyahu and uh, Netanyahu's defense minister Gallant. Yet the Dutch position on this has not changed really till now. Do you personally think that we should be calling for more than ceasefire here? I think that first and foremost, we have to call for cease, continue to call for for a ceasefire. I think the humanitarian situation in Gaza is a, is beyond uh, words uh, to uh, to describe. It's a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, uh, there has to be a ceasefire. There is no way that you are going to solve this issue uh, with putting more uh, military in. Uh, there is there has to be a plan for the future. Uh, and that plan has to be uh, that there has to be a safe Israel and there has to be a safe Palestine. There has to be a safe place for Palestine people. Uh, and, the, and we cannot, uh, this cannot go on uh, like uh, this. And that is, uh, I think, what must happen uh, now, uh, immediately. So in case that the Dutch red line on a policy is crossed like it was in Rafa, is the response then just a fiercer call for a ceasefire? Or do you think that we have further tools of diplomacy that we can use other tools? Here? I think we've, we're using all tools of diplomacy. I, my colleague, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, she has uh, put on the table in Brussels successfully the EU-Israel Association Agreement. 
And that was a big step uh, to take, uh, because that means that the whole of the European Union has united on debating this issue with Israel, uh, putting this, uh, the, our demands on the table uh, to, to Israel. Uh, and that was a big step, and it was a Dutch initiative. And I, I think, I mean, it feels, of course, you feel um, that you have, that there is little that you can do. And that's true, because we only have uh, our our diplomacy uh, to put pressure uh, on Israel. But uh, uh, that is what, what we do, and what we will continue to do. You're also limited by the fact that you are an outgoing minister. We have fin finally are getting a new government. Um, your the latest Dutch Ukraine package is incredibly popular internationally. The four parties that are going to form the new government were critical. They called it governing over the grave. Um, given how long formation processes have started last taking in the Netherlands, yeah. caretaker governments need to make m more and more difficult decisions. How democratic can those be? Well, they're completely democratic. I, I think I've been Minister of Defense for now for a, uh, almost a year uh, after the political crisis announcement of new elections and the formation of a new government. And we have said from day one, when it comes to Ukraine and when it comes to strengthening our armed forces, we will continue. We may be caretaker in a name, but this is this is our responsibility. And there has always been Parliament to control us, uh, and they have uh, they have uh, you know they have been stimulating this to do more for Ukraine. The previous Parliament, also the current Parliament, is very supportive for doing more for Ukraine, and it's also very supportive of strengthening the armed forces. So in that way, I, I really can say that I've not been limited by uh, the caretaker uh, status. Also internationally, uh, people and partners have seen that we have just continued, that we're good for our uh, word and our, um, uh, our signature. Uh, and that means also that the next government can take over from there. We have, we have built it up. Uh, they can just continue building. Uh, and I hope that's just what they will do. After you, along with the third Rutte cabinet, resigned after the scandal or the, the subsidy affair, there was a lot of dissatisfaction from the public with having a lot of questions and then hearing back statements like we are only the missionary government, this will be solved, this will be looked at later. How do you think that this kind of a setup of having extremely long formation processes and having very long standing and active um, demissionary governments affects the way that people can trust their governments? Well, uh, there are two countries in the world that have these type of uh, government formations, Belgium and the Netherlands, and the record holder is still Belgium. So uh, we are not the worst. <laughs> 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 and in Belgium, actually, there, the people say that uh, these, these year and a half or two years of uh, government formations are not necessarily bad for the country. I think the economy in general uh, is... is you know, just continues, and even even sometimes people say it's even better uh, without the politics interfering in the, in the economy. But um, no, I think it's different. You know, in in the UK, uh, one time they had elections. I don't remember which year it was, and they had to form a coalition. Twenty ten. Twenty ten. Twenty ten. Right. With Nick and, yeah, as well. Nick Clegg. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And then they said to me, "Oh, it was terrible. We had three agonizing days." I said, three days. <laughs> that's, that's nothing." I, I don't really think it's an issue, quite frankly. I think it depends It depends on, on what you're working at. For us, at defense, it was not an issue. And of course, there there are limitations to what you can do. But the longer you are demissionaire, as we call it here in the Netherlands, the less you feel it. And you simply continue, and there is always parliament to approve or not to approve. And, and that's how democracy works. I'm sure that some people might agree with those statements about the economy improving without <laughs> politics interfering. I personally will stay disagreeing on that. Um, and I think that it's still unanswered the question of then how really people can trust the government after you resign, after doing something wrong. I'm not Sorry, not saying you personally, no, 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 but no. a cabinet. <laughs> uh, but after a cabinet does something wrong, yeah. there's crisis, they fall back and they call elections and then they don't really have to answer. Do you think they really that by saying that yeah, Belgium also has it, that's the way the people can trust no, it? No, but I think if you do something wrong, eh, going back to the, the, the previous government, where we, we resigned because we thought that was the right thing to do, yeah. because of the Tuslag affair. So we resigned. People had elections, they elected, they voted for who they wanted to vote. They, we had a new parliament, 
uh, and from there on, there had to be a new government. And that takes time because you have to form coalitions. We don't have majorities of one party, or not even of two or three. Well, three we have now, but okay. So they agreed on four anyway. Not uh, they didn't have to, but they took took four parties. So it it takes time. So but we have the, the democracy is that you can go and vote, uh, and that we that we do take responsibility for for things. And I think uh, people in the Netherlands know on beforehand when they vote for a party, they will not necessarily get only that party. They will get two or three more, uh, and that is. That's how we do it. Uh, I think there are there are other ways. You can have a threshold, uh, so you have less parties in, in parliament. You can have form coalitions before the election, so that you know that if you vote for this party, you will get those as well. But it's not how we do it in the Netherlands. Yeah. So, um, as well as wrapping up this interview, um, you are also leaving your position. 12 days, I just heard. Um, you were... At in The Hague yesterday to talk about the lessons you learned during your term, um, during one of the most uh, consequential terms, I think, um, in terms in defense in a long time. What would some of those lessons be that you've really learned? Uh, well, I've learned a lot, but I, I think maybe two. So first of all, the strength of cooperation, uh, that you, you can almost never solve anything on your own as a country. Uh, as a military organization, uh, you have to cooperate with other countries, within structures, within coalitions, within organizations. So the strength uh, of cooperation and also the strength of teams. Uh, and uh, I talked yesterday about, yesterday about leadership uh, and what leadership really is. And leadership, I think, is also uh, that you listen, uh, that you listen uh, to advice, uh, that you listen uh, to, you know, the... the, the always try to argue uh, things and uh, that is the strength I think of our our Dutch um, uh, democracy or, or of the policy making the way we work uh, having people strong institutions who give their opinion who give their professional expertise and advice uh, and, uh, and that is something also for for the future I think we must hold that very dear uh, I think it's vital uh, that we uh, that those institutions can function without political interference uh, and uh, but as a minister of defense I think uh, also you know, what that we there has been a sort of a re um, uh, valuing of of our military uh, and that we do need to have our military men and women to keep us safe uh, I think that is a good thing and I hope that I've built started to build uh, on um, uh, a modern uh, and capable uh, Ministry of Defense and Armed Forces, uh, and that we are stronger now than we were two and a half years ago, and that will have to continue. And what would you tell your successor to focus on, to implement those lessons that you've learned? Well, I would tell to my successor, uh, look at what we have left you. You can just start there where we <laughs> left it and continue. <laughs> yeah. Thank you everyone for joining us here today at the Marina Terrain for this very special interview. This was part of our Lustrum series. We as a platform are now 15 and we are very happy to have had such a wonderful um, interview to celebrate it. For more of our interviews, we are always at the E-Hall at Rutgers Island campus. And tomorrow we have there an interview at 11 with Gerd Jan Segers. It's at one. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's at one and it's the yeah. final interview of the year. Um, I hope to see you there. Thank you again, Minister Olo. Thank questions? you very much. We've had, I mean... Can we clap and then you can come up, maybe? Sure. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Yeah.